SpaceX has been actively developing the Starship launch vehicle since 2019. Every spacecraft and rocket component has undergone testing and improvement throughout the years to build a reliable vehicle, including the Raptor engines that power the launch vehicle. The Raptor engine is a full-flow staged combustion cycle engine that runs on cryogenic liquid oxygen and liquid methane propellants. The Starship prototype launched on April 20 was equipped with the second generation of the engine known as Raptor V2, which SpaceX describes as having more power and fewer parts than the first-generation engines. The first-generation Raptor V1 engines generated around 1.81 MN of thrust, and the current V2 engines generate around 2.3 MN. Recently, a third version of the Raptor engine, called Raptor V3, reached a new thrust record on a tripod test stand at SpaceX's McGregor test facility. The engine achieved 2.64 MN, or 269 tons of thrust, operating at a chamber pressure of 350 bar. Three years ago, Raptor V1 survived a chamber pressure of 330 bar, however, that was the peak pressure attained at a particular instant during a ground test. The V3 variant not only survived 350 bar peak pressure, but also operated consistently at that pressure for more than 50 seconds. A huge achievement for SpaceX. According to Elon Musk, SpaceX did not expect the engine to survive a full duration test at that high chamber pressure. With 33 Raptor V3 engines, future super-heavy prototypes will produce a total thrust of 87.12 MN, or 8,877 tons, making the Starship the most powerful rocket in history. Compared to the original Raptor, Raptor 2 lacks a large amount of plumbing and sensors, giving it a much cleaner look. By removing many of these components, SpaceX has made the engine lighter, significantly decreasing the launch vehicle's total mass. Raptor V1 had a mass of 2,000 kg, and Raptor V2 weighed 1,600 kg. Raptor V3 could be even lighter than V2 engines, further decreasing the overall mass of both Super Heavy and Starship vehicles. SpaceX has yet to share images, videos, and more information about the V3 engine. I think we will have to wait for Musk's next Starship presentation to get more info regarding the V3 engines. Overall, it is clear that Raptor will continue to evolve in the coming years as SpaceX builds, tests, and flies more engines. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from Starbase. SpaceX teams at the Starbase launch site continue to repair and upgrade the orbital launch pad damaged during the Starship integrated test flight last month. Once the launch pad returns to its original shape, SpaceX will begin the installation of the water-cooled steel plates under the launch mount. At the production site, teams have already started pre-assembling the steel plates on the water supply pipes and manifolds. In this graphic created by Ryan Hansen Space, you can see how the launch pad will look once the steel plates are installed. Pressurized water pumped from the water tank will reach the steel plates through the supply pipes and manifold. Water will flow into the channels under the steel plates from six locations around the launch mount. The steel plates have holes through which the water will be discharged under the launch mount, like a shower head. The water released will cool the metal surface and simultaneously absorb energy from the booster engine plume. SpaceX recently shared a video where a Raptor engine test fire into a water-cooled steel plate. In this video, you can see how powerfully the water is ejected from the holes in the plates. Please check out my previous video for a detailed explanation of how the steel plate water distribution system will operate. Link in the description. Many concrete pilings have been recently installed around the orbital launch mount to support the water-cooled plates that will be installed on top of it. Teams have also begun installing pilings directly below the launch mount. More concrete piles will be added in the coming days. Parts of the large underground pipes that carry propellants from the orbital tank farm to the launch mount have been removed lately. It looks like this has been done so the pipes can be rerouted to make room for the pilings and the water supply pipe. Some of the horizontal high-pressure storage tanks at the tank farm were damaged by debris from the integrated flight test that took place last month. Teams have begun removing and replacing those tanks. According to Musk, the main vertical propellant storage tanks will be replaced by horizontal tanks to avoid accidents during Starship launches. SpaceX is preparing to begin the static fire testing of Starship 25. Ship 25 began its cryo-proof test campaign on November 1 last year and has undergone a total of three cryo-proof tests at the launch site before returning to the build site for engine installation. The ship was sent to SpaceX's Massey's test site in February, where the prototype underwent two cryo-proof tests. 
On May 16, SpaceX tried to move the ship back to Starbase, but that rollout attempt was later aborted due to some unknown reason. The next morning, Ship 25 slowly restarted its journey back to Starbase, and after several pauses and delays, the ship finally reached the launch site early Thursday morning. Several hours later, a crane lifted the ship and placed it atop suborbital launch pad B. According to SpaceX, Ship 25 will attempt to ignite all six Raptor engines during the upcoming static fire test. Before Ship 25's rollout, SpaceX conducted a flight termination test at the Massey's test site with the B-6 test tank. After filling the test tank with water, SpaceX engineers activated the flight termination system mounted on the tank's exterior. The rupture occurred near the common dome of the test tank, successfully splitting it into two halves. Elon Musk had previously stated that during the integrated flight test, there was an unplanned delay of about 40 seconds between the initiation of the flight termination system and the rocket breaking apart. According to Musk, this time lag posed no safety issues with the rocket safely offshore, but it is still unacceptable for a system designed to terminate flight almost immediately. The test conducted at Massey's last week could be a test to requalify the flight termination system before the next integrated test flight. Speaking of Starship test flights, SpaceX recently filed an application to the FCC for communications for Starship's second test flight. The license will last from June 15 to December 15, and if needed, it can be extended. As a reminder, this does not mean the second test flight will happen as soon as June 15. For reference, the FCC permit for Starship's first flight was filed on 13 May 2021, with operations set to begin on June 20, 2021. However, the license was renewed multiple times since then, and the launch happened 22 months later, on 20 April 2023. SpaceX has hired Kathy Lewiters, who left her position as NASA's human spaceflight head at the end of April, to serve as a general manager at Starbase. She will report directly to Gwynne Shotwell, president and COO of SpaceX. It's a vital hire for SpaceX as the company works to make Starship safe for passenger flights in the coming years. Lewiters already has a good understanding of SpaceX's existing Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft. She collaborated with SpaceX to launch numerous astronaut trips to the ISS when she was employed by NASA. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. The second private astronaut mission, Axiom Mission 2, or AX-2, operated by Axiom Space, has been cleared for launch to the International Space Station. The mission will be led by Peggy Whitson, Director of Human Space Flight at Axiom Space and a former NASA astronaut. Whitson, who holds a PhD in biochemistry, has flown three missions to the International Space Station in the past and has spent 665 days in space. She commanded the orbiting complex twice and completed 10 spacewalks. Aviator John Schaffner, who has more than 8,500 flight hours in various commercial aircraft and helicopters, will serve as the AX-2 mission pilot. AX-2 mission specialists Ali Al-Karni and Rihanna Barnawi from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will become the first Saudi Arabians to visit the ISS. Al-Karni is a fighter pilot with nearly 2,400 hours of flight experience. Barnawi has several degrees in biomedical sciences, and her work on AX-2 will concentrate on breast cancer and stem cell research. AX-2 is scheduled for liftoff aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center on May 21. Following a roughly 16-hour journey to low Earth orbit, the Dragon spacecraft carrying the four-person crew will dock to the space station's Harmony module on May 22. If AX-2 can't get off the ground on Sunday, it has another chance on Monday, May 22. If the mission misses that backup opportunity, it will have to wait until after one or more other missions that are scheduled to launch to the space station in the coming months. Once aboard the space station, the crew will have a busy schedule of research experiments and technology demonstrations. The crew plans to conduct more than 20 investigations in total. The AX-2 crew is scheduled to undock from the space station at the end of May and will then descend through Earth's atmosphere and splash down in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Florida. NASA has chosen Blue Origin-led national team to develop a second lunar landing system for the agency's Artemis program. And so today, we, NASA, announced that Blue Origin and partners Lockheed Martin, Draper, Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee Robotics will build a human landing system to deliver NASA astronauts to the lunar surface. Under the award, the team will design, develop, test, and verify its Blue Moon Lander to meet NASA's human landing system requirements for recurring astronaut expeditions to the lunar surface. 
Initially, NASA's Space Launch System rocket will launch four astronauts to lunar orbit aboard the Orion spacecraft. Once Orion docks with the Lunar Gateway outpost, two astronauts will transfer to the Blue Moon lander for about a week-long trip to the Moon's South Pole region to conduct science and exploration activities. The contract awarded on May 19 includes one uncrewed demonstration mission to the lunar surface before a crewed demo on the Artemis V mission in 2029. The total award value of the firm fixed price contract is $3.4 billion. NASA selected SpaceX to develop a Starship human landing system in April 2021 at a price of around $2.9 billion for the Artemis III mission currently scheduled for 2025. SpaceX was awarded a second contract in November of last year to develop another Starship lunar lander for the Artemis IV mission scheduled for 2028. Last March NASA announced it would open competition for a second landing system to ensure it has two providers to choose from for future missions. For that reason, SpaceX was not eligible to compete for the recently awarded contract. However, SpaceX and the national team will be eligible to compete for future crewed missions to the moon beyond Artemis V. NASA shuts down the lunar flashlight spacecraft sent to the moon to search for water ice deposits at the lunar south pole. NASA launched the flashlight spacecraft as a secondary payload on Japan's Hakuto-R mission, which lifted off aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in December. Once deployed, the spacecraft was expected to start a four-month journey to the moon, after which point it would look for surface water ice at the moon's perpetually dark south pole. On May 12, NASA announced the agency was ending its mission, as the spacecraft could not go into its planned polar orbit around the moon because its propulsion system could not produce the required thrust. NASA suspected that debris of some kind was blocking propellant lines, reducing the amount of propellant reaching the thrusters. Engineers spent several months trying to troubleshoot the problem, which was identified shortly after spacecraft's launch. On May 5, NASA said they were making one final effort to clear the obstructions by increasing fuel pump pressures far beyond operational limits while opening and closing valves. That technique, tried on one of the spacecraft's four thrusters, had shown some success, inconsistently producing some increased thrust levels. However, those efforts weren't enough to keep the spacecraft in the vicinity of the moon, leading NASA to bring the mission to an end. Without the propulsion system producing consistent thrust, the spacecraft will now leave the Earth-Moon system and continue into an orbit around the Sun. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.